ಸಿಂಗ್ಲಾ Uh, is it still dark there? Yeah, with a ghost. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just take it, sir. Sorry, sorry about it, sir. Is it better, sir? It's okay. I, I think you can stay with it. No problem. Yes, sir. So, either one minute, um, uh, we will go live. Because okay, now, sir. we can't see this uh, attendees list actually. Arish, where are you working, pa? Good evening, sir. Where do you work, Arish? Sir, I am working in uh, Bagalcourt, sir. Oh, yes. okay. It's in medical college. Okay. Along with uh, Muthalik, sir. Along with Narayan. Hmm. So, yes. how many of you are there? Sir, we are six of us here. Oh, my. Yeah. <laughs> six psychiatrists there, is it? The yes, sir. Wow. Wow. <laughs> in this uh, hospital there are two psychiatrists are there yena pa in this hospital there are two more psychiatrists oh yenti idira matte yeah yes yeah, sir yes sir sir namaskara sir namaskara so sir chenagi idira sir oh chenagi idivi ek car alli idira oh sir inna mottilla adu journey madta idu tire bere odada sir ivattu adu madhyadalli step ne hakkond bartta idire ಸರ್ ಸರ್ ಶಾಲ್ ವಿ ಗೋ ಲೈವ್ ಸರ್ ಜನ ಇದ್ದಾರಪ್ಪ ಸ್ವಲ್ಪ ಪಪ್ಪ ಹಾ ಸರ್ ಚೆಕ್ ಮಾಡಬೇಕು ಸರ್ ಈಗ ನೋಡಿ ಇವನು ಎಷ್ಟು ಜನ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ಶ್ರೀರಾಮ್ ವಿಲ್ ಗೋ ಲೈವ್ ಸರ್ ಎಸ್ ಸರ್ ಹೌ ಮೆನಿ ಆರ್ देयर ಪಾರ್ಟಿಸಿಪೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಸರ್ ನನ್ನ ನೀವು ಜಾಯಿನ್ ಸರ್ बिकॉज ಯು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ನಾಟ್ ಓಪನ್ಡ್ ಇಟ್ ದೇ ಗೋ ಓಪನ್ ಇಟ್ ಎಸ್ ಸರ್ ಓಪನ್ ಅಪ್ಪ ಓಪನ್ we can wait for a few minutes so that people can join in yes sir yes sir sure sir hi vinay yeah hi hi sir chala hi ja yes sir aram sir okay pa uh one do
Currently there are twenty six attendees, sir, and there will be some more on YouTube also. Hmm. Usually, what is the attendance for for these series? Sir, uh, uh, usually it reaches up to hundred at some point of time. Aha, uh and -huh. all PG no, or? Yes, sir. Uh, PG is all over Karnataka. Hundred and faculty. Yes. ನಮ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಈಗ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಪಿ ಜಿ ಇದಾರೆ ಸರ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಇಯರ್ ತ್ರೀ ಪಿ ಜಿ ಸೊ ಹಂಗೆ ಅಟ್ಲೀಸ್ಟ್ ಒಂದು ಬಿಗ್ ನಂಬರ್ Hmm. Yes, shall we start sir now it is 33 and 7 panelists hmm. so there will be some more on youtube okay whichever way i mean i leave it to you okay okay so sir sir you are muted bijal sir unmute maar yeah 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 okay uh, sir, good good evening to one and all on behalf of indian psychiatric society karnataka chapter i welcome uh, our teacher dr raghuram sir uh, to chair this uh, psychopathology series um, uh, number 4 uh, in the earlier uh, uh, in the earlier series dr uh, ravichandra karkala and uh, dr vasudha has uh, spoken about uh, disorders of thought speech Perfect. and its form content and also possession uh, uh, disorders of the uh, also related to hallucination yeah? and currently we are going with the disorders of uh, memory in which uh, our one of our colleague and my friend dr vinay will be speaking so on behalf of indian psychiatric society i welcome dr agram sir and i request him to chair the session good evening and welcome sir thank you thank you so and, uh, i welcome uh, yeah i welcome dr vinay uh, to uh, this uh, series from indian psychiatric society as a speaker and also i welcome both the moderators uh, dr narayan mutalik and uh, harish kulkarni and all the participants and uh, thank you thank you dr somshek bijal sir maybe okay. connection is off yes sir okay my uh... it is my privilege to uh, have uh, our teacher dr raghuram as a chairperson for this session so uh, as a formal introduction uh, dr raghuram sir is a well known teacher and researcher in the field of psychiatry he worked for over two decades as professor of psychiatry at emhans uh, and subsequently went over to the united arab uh, emirates to initiate a post graduate residency program in psychiatry for the first time in that region after completing this assignment he was professor and head department of psychiatry uh, at kempe gowda institute of uh, medical sciences bangalore his main interest has been in the field of cultural psychiatry wherein he has employed anthropological approaches to examine cultural and contextual determinants of psychiatric problems a commonwealth fellowship facilitated uh, his tenure at the department of cultural anthropology at the university college london and subsequently as a who fellow he was at the department of culture community and health studies at the university of toronto he was a consultant at the international center for the study of uh, culture and medicine at harvard university he was a visiting professor under the nimhans 
Fulbright Academic Initiative Program at the Department of Psychiatry and Robert Wood Johnson Medical School at New Jersey, United States of America. And he was a instrumental in initiating a cross-cultural exchange program of medical students and psychiatric residents. He has been in the Board of Governors of the World Association of Cultural Psychiatry for two terms. In this capacity, he represented the South Asian region. He is on the advisory board of the Center for Psychotherapy and Clinical Research, Ambedkar University, in New Delhi. He has over 50 research publications and chapters in books. And in particular, he has been involved in examining cultural and social factors influencing the experience of stigma. He also carried out a field study exploring the impact of traditional healing methods on the severely mentally ill. He has received several awards, both nationally and internationally, significant among them being DLN Muti Rao Award, S.S. Jairam Award, Bhagwat Award, Bombay Psychiatry Society Silver Jubilee Award. He was a scholar in residency at the uh, University of Basel, uh, Switzerland, where he was invited to give the prestigious Georgi Memorial Lecture. He is a, a fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, UK. He is the recipient of the Distinguished Psychiatric Award of the Indian Psychiatric Society, Karnataka Chapter. He is a member of the advisory board of the Center of Psychotherapy and Clinical Research, Ambedkar University, New Delhi. He is the founder, trustee of the NGO, Padai, which is involved in uh, uh, education for the underprivileged rural children. Besides his academic involvement, Professor Raghuram is a nature enthusiast an avid bird watcher with an abiding interest in the visual art. It is our privilege to have you, sir. I welcome you, sir. Thank you. I uh, request uh, Dr. Hari to invite uh, and introduce uh, uh, our speaker, Dr. Vinay Echa. Good evening, one and all. Uh, it gives me an immense pleasure to invite and introduce uh, today's uh, speaker, Dr. Vinay HR, who is currently working as assistant professor in Department of Psychiatry, Adi Chunchangiri Institute of Medical Science, Adi, Adi Chunchangiri University, BG Nagar, Mandya District. He did his MBBS from Bangalore Medical College and DPM from Nimans, and uh, further he did DNB from Pan Spandana Hospital, Bangalore. He is currently medical education unit member. He has done advanced course in medical education. Currently, he is co-chairperson in Indian Psychiatry Society Undergraduate Education Subcommittee. His areas of interest are community psychiatry and medical education. I welcome you, sir, for today's program. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harish. Sir, I request uh, Dr. Raghuram, sir, to speak a few words about the, today's topic. Yeah. See, as you understand, the focus this evening is on memory and its disturbances. As you're all aware, memory plays a very crucial role in impacting and modulating human behavior. More so when a person is under some kind of psychological distress. So it is extremely important in our routine clinical assessment to comprehensively evaluate various manifestations of memory disturbances. It is in this light that today's program is quite important as Vinay will take us through the various manifestations of memory problems as we encounter in our clinical practice, their importance and how to evaluate them. I must also add that this entire psychopathology series series is very distinctive in that we have young, talented teachers to address the postgraduate students. I think it's a very important initiative by the IPSKC. And over to you, Vinay, to take us through the memory landscape. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'm sharing my screen now. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, are my slides visible? 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Uh, at the outset, let me uh, congratulate uh, IPS KC for this initiative and also thank the organizing team for having given me this opportunity to interact with you all. And uh, it's also a privilege and also an apprehension that uh, the session that I'm presenting is being chaired by Dr. Raghuram sir, who is regarded as teacher of teachers. And uh, I'll, I'll, uh, what I'll do is, um, today's session on disorders of memory, so let me put it with a disclaimer that uh, the topic of memory is so broad and fundamental, not only to the discipline of psychiatry, but life as a whole. So in that regard, the information provided here will not be exhaustive and complete. And also, uh, there are a lot of literature available in standard psychopathology textbooks regarding this topic. Uh, I am restricting to clinical utility with examples rather than in a comprehensive presentation. Please forgive me uh, in this regard that uh, because always uh, when I was a postgraduate, uh, I used to think that uh, should we go in detail about psychopathology? What is the clinical utility of it? And is there uh, anything that I can draw inferences from it and which can be useful while managing a patient or patient care? So in that regard, I thought this presentation uh, would actually uh, stimulate uh, people to uh, uh, appreciate the relevance of going through, understand the psychopathology in terms of uh, all the phenomenon, phenomenons so that uh, they come up with innovations or creative ideas as well to address the issues. Okay, right then. So uh, it has become a habit for me that uh, while teaching undergraduates that to state uh, learning objectives before in hand. So I hope uh, it is both for uh, the learners to focus on what has to be learned and also for the teachers to uh, reflect back on whether they have done justice or not during the session. So at the end of this session, I hope the learners will be able to mention the broader classification of disorders of memory, state examples under each subcategory, discuss the clinical utility of understanding psychopathology concerned with disorders of memory. And lastly, appreciate the relevance of knowing about memory imp impairment during. So uh, let me rush through a, a basic concepts here. So memory, as we understand and define as a faculty of brain by which the data or the information is registered, that is encoded, stored, and retrieved when needed. So this kind of a storage, memory storage, is organized as a sensory memory. A sensory memory is a, the information received in a, any of the sensory modality, which usually lasts for about maybe few seconds. For example, it could be auditory that uh, uh, usually we say echoic memory. So or in uh, case of visual images, it's a iconic memory, we say that. So, and then comes short-term memory, wherein uh, the sensory memory gets processed and whether if there, are, there is some active rehearsal of a, a sensory memory, then it goes on to become a short-term memory, which lasts from a few seconds to two minutes. So it is this short-term memory when further processed will become a long-term memory. Again, under this long-term memory, we have a, a classification in terms of uh, explicit, which is a declarative, or implicit, implicit that is non-declarative. Explicit memory is to do with uh, conscious uh, storage and recollection of the data and the information, under which there is semantic and episodic memories. Well, semantic memory is uh, kind of a non-specific wherein, for example, uh, if uh, people remember that, okay, Dr. Vinay HR is a psychiatrist. So that's a semantic, while episodic memory will be, okay, Dr. Vinay HR presented a session on this day at this time with a specifier like time and place. While implicit memory deals with the unconscious storage and retrieval, the classical example uh, that we see is, uh, for example, riding a bike or playing a instrument, musical instrument, so on. So uh, moving further, so there are a few other basic concepts that is stages of memory. So uh, usually it is registration or encoding to start with, retention or storage and retrieval. 
So here in uh, the comes to two other uh, components that is recognition and recall. Uh, registration is nothing but uh, uh, addition of a uh, newer data or information to the memory store. While retention is the maintenance, the ability to maintain such a memory. In the under retrieval, so I, I can give an example. Like for example, uh, somebody is uh, sitting on a mm, Kondmanega Karupati kind of a uh, setup wherein they ask a multiple choice questions, uh, which is the capital of France. So either it is uh, Paris, New Delhi, or uh, Rome. So pinpointing on uh, Paris would be a recognition. While recall, for example, directly asking uh, without any options. So which is the capital of France? So that's a recall. So that's a subtle difference in the recognition and recall here. Yeah. Coming to the classification of uh, the disorders of memory. So we can classify broadly as uh, amnesias which is a uh, total or partial uh, uh, inability to uh, retrieve the information paramnesia which is distortion of memory hyperamnesia is uh, it's an exaggerated registration or uh, retrieval or retention of memory so under amnesia uh, it can be psychogenic for example, seen in dissociative, anxiety states, depression. There can be impairment of registration, impairment of retention and retrieval. And lastly, uh, uh, one other phenomenon called as perseveration. Under paramnesias, uh, it can be distortions of recall, that is retrospective falsification, confabulation, false memory, retrospective delusions, cryptamnesia, to name few. And distortion of recognition would be Deja Vu and Jamai Su, which even uh, many people normally also experience. Under hyperamnesia, we have uh, flash bulb memories and flashbacks. We'll see uh, uh, a bit in detail about uh, uh, these things. So as I uh, stated earlier, what I'll do is, uh, while stating each of this phenomenon, I'll just uh, try to uh, give examples which I have encountered or experienced uh, in my clinical practice, short clinical practice. So, uh, and also wherein uh, some of the instances wherein uh, those understanding has helped in clinical care or management of a particular case. Okay. So, first of all, we take up uh, psychogenic uh, amnesia. So, under which uh, we have uh, dissociative amnesias. So, I, uh, I can re uh, remember one case here of a girl who presented to us. Uh, she was, she was actually uh, traveling in a train alone for some emergency from a uh, uh, northern uh, uh, state of India to a southern state here. So in between, it happened so that uh, she was given a juice mixed with some kind of sedative. And upon uh, taking which, uh, she uh, got uh, sedated. And in the uh, process, so she was also robbed. I mean, our uh, uh, ornaments and all were robbed. And after that, she had this dissociative amnesia and she traveled for one or two days uh, uh, aimlessly uh, some other places and then ultimately landed up at our place. So uh, when she presented, she uh, said that she, uh, she uh, kind of had a um, newer uh, identity. That is, uh, she used to say that she's a Lakshmi goddess. And uh, though parents had brought her, Along with she was she was uh, not able to uh, uh, remember or uh, the remember the relationship with them, but still she kept on saying that let them be there with her. Okay, so what we did was uh, because this dissociative amnesia doesn't have a kind of organic uh, basis in terms of uh, 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 like unlike in dementia or uh, cerebrovascular diseases. So here, uh, what we did was. We tried to extract information as to what what had happened with their actual parents, and we use, we thought of even making use of drug assisted interviews. So some of the things we tried to elicit from her regarding her parents. So she used to accept that okay, this happened, this happened, but ultimately she used to refuse that they are not her parents. In between, we also I mean it happened so that she had a, a kind of a disappointment that. 
nobody contacted her or didn't care for her when she was actually uh, left unattended at a train so she had kind of a, a, a irritability towards parents that way so uh, we tried uh, eliciting those uh, uh, memory related to her uh, parents and also tried to elicit simultaneously some of the events that had occurred in the train so so ultimately what happened was uh, i mean she could actually correlate with the both and somehow reach a kind of a, it happened so that bargaining and uh, uh, though uh, she outwardly refused that uh, the parents are not a parents but she consigned we consigned with them and one other example with regard to anxiety so uh, your many of the students particularly undergraduate students they come to us saying like uh, they keep forgetting whatever they have read and uh, your the psychopathology revolves around those heightened awareness of oneself and uh, because of which they tend to get preoccupied with uh, so many other things of external uh, nature like uh, tremulousness their peripheral manifestations of anxiety so uh, one of the simple simple measures that we take up was uh, you might be knowing that uh, during exams they have internal examiners as well so we made use of that in terms of saying like uh, there will be obviously a internal examiner with whom you know for uh, months so you don't have to worry much so if there is anything they'll be supportive and not there was no unfair means used here so uh, but uh, i mean with that context when they were sent in i mean they attended viva with uh, better uh, performances so uh, that's regarding anxiety and with regard to depression uh, i have to uh, mention here one case wherein uh, uh, a girl undergraduate girl who was having a bipolar illness so she was uh, when during her depressive state she used to say that uh, uh, her anancastic traits of uh, uh, not being clean or uh, uh, repeatedly checking so those used to uh, be predominant while in her manic phase when she was uh, unusually dressed up so you she used to even uh, comment about our uh, Uh, perfumes or uh, are dressing everything in detail so that's a difference there so uh, what we did was whenever she was in a depressive state so in terms of uh, psychotherapy sessions so our clinical psychologist were making use of uh, trying to remind her during a depressive phase whatever she used to say in a depressive phase or whatever she used to do during a manic phase so in that way at least there was a help in terms of clinical utility here is that she used to be compliant to the medications at least while reminding her of during what happened during the manic phases and other thing with regard to psychogenic amnesia here is selective forgetting so it can be either retroactive or proactive interference moving further so uh, organic amnesia so the impairment of registration in terms of anterograde amnesia can be there so particular uh, example i would take up here is of dementia wherein uh, they have difficulty in registration and for the new memories so that's the reason why in terms of uh, while managing the case so we actually uh, uh, tell the caregivers to schedule i mean do a day, uh, schedule routine and put up as a display so that uh, because they have a difficulty in registration they keep seeing at that and then try to i mean uh, know about it and try to follow harder to the routine so in their own language that's it okay so coming to the impairment of retention so we usually see a retrograde uh, amnesia here. so we had a case of a, a road traffic accident wherein uh, our own student uh, had met with and she had uh, uh, rib fractures and uh, she had to be i mean she developed a, um, uh, a pneumothorax and she uh, icd insertion was done because uh, she doesn't remember that what happened during the car accident wherein her uh, actually friend died so she used to have this guilt that whether did i made sure that she um, uh, put her she well on or did i make her to sit 
in the front seat, uh, back seat. That's just to have the skill. Since uh, we thought that, yeah, it's a retrograde uh, amnesia that she'll be having. And uh, for those events, just before the actual occurrence of the accident, so few hours, maybe one or two hours, she didn't have a memory to it. So because of the guilt, so during our psychotherapy sessions, what we did was uh, we actually manipulated in terms of like said that uh, she was indeed uh, seated uh, at the uh, front seat and also wore a seat belt. And uh, since she didn't have a memory to it, she uh, lived in it and uh, that made her feel comfortable. Okay. So that's an example there. And uh, with regard to the retrieval, impairment of retrieval, uh, here the problem, like for example, in dementias or in um, uh, cases where in uh, cerebrovascular accidents, so the person faces difficulty in retrieving the information. And that's the reason as a consequence, they can have either uh, confabulation, even in it, it's seen in Korsakoff syndromes as well, and also kind of a anxiety or irritability because of the embarrassment they face while trying to retrieve the information. So there is not much of a experience in this regard, whether in terms of clinical utility, but uh, uh, in, in cases wherein they have difficulty in retrieving, particularly in cases of early dementias, so they have still retain, I mean, those people who have retained the ability of uh, remembering it, retrieving it with some cues. So it serves as a useful uh, intervention, particularly the caregivers can start making use of uh, some cues so that they remember. And uh, lastly, uh, in under uh, organic amnesia, perseveration. So perseveration is, uh, for an example, uh, we had a patient uh, wherein uh, uh, on asking a question, what's your name? He would say, uh, uh, Raja Ram. And then on asking about uh, uh, which place you come from, again, he kept on saying Raja Ram. So that's what is called as perseveration. So here, uh, the clinical utility, what we had was, uh, we tried, I mean, it's a, a experience wherein said that uh, sensory modality was changed. For example, we, uh, we kept asking about uh, uh, an auditory modality. So we changed it to a tactile wherein we touched and made the hand to uh, move in a particular way and asked him to do the same. So after that, again, we came back to the auditory modality. So then the perception wasn't seen. I mean, the, I mean, wasn't seen in the sense, I mean, they didn't repeat. So it can have, it's not sure, but at least I thought of making a mention here. Coming to the paramnesias, so we have uh, distortions of recall, like retrospective falsification. I already said uh, regarding uh, mood states and memory. So we have uh, pretty many cases uh, and also it can be assumed. I uh, imagine that whenever we are in a depressed state, so we, uh, I mean, as patients, they to recollect only the negative aspects of it and uh, kind of suffer more. So, and then with regard to the confabulation, which is seen more often in a Korsakoff syndrome. So because of, I already mentioned about uh, embarrassment they face or irritability because they don't remember it well. I mean, uh, they have difficulty in retrieval. So they keep uh, telling about false stories or uh, events that have never happened or distort even the events that have happened. With regard to false memory, uh, we had a case wherein uh, a patient with a, a cerebrovascular accident. So he had uh, uh, remembered that, uh, I mean, just before uh, the cerebrovascular accident happened. So uh, he had a uh, false memory that uh, his wife actually uh, uh, had pushed him. So uh, though it was actually the uh, wife had actually tried to help him out while uh, making him uh, uh, not to fall down. So this is one example of a false memory that they can have uh, in an organic uh, state. And uh, retrospective delusions. So uh, one example I would like to take here is that uh, one woman, she had uh, schizophrenia. So actually because of the uh, violent uh, nature of hers, uh, her symptoms, 
a family members had uh, uh, resorted to physical restraint and also hit her sometimes so and they taken her to the police and while she was symptomatic she had uh, this kind of a uh, retrospective delusions that uh, actually uh, the police people even including cbi have raped her so that's an example of a retrospective though the memory as i mean having approached to the police is true but they kind of a make give a delusional uh, meaning to the retrospective event so coming to the uh, cryptamnesia cryptamnesia uh, an example i would give you is of a patient who had a bipolar disorder because of the mood state he was in uh, he used to uh, quote few uh, excerpts from the uh, person uh, famous quote and used to say that it's his own so that is a example of cryptamnesia so uh, what happened was we we said during a psychotherapy sessions that uh, uh, there are people who have uh, actually uh, uh, accepted that they, okay maybe somewhere they would have read and uh, maybe there is a kind of a confusion and it's okay to accept because many of the times what happens is that because of the sense of uh, 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 losing the reputation or fear so they kind of a uh, try to uh, justify it so that's one example of cryptamnesia then coming to the distortions of recognition deja vu and jamai su so wherein uh, people experience the uh, familiarity though unfamiliar with or other way around so coming to the uh, hyperamnesia uh, we have uh, flash bulb memories or flashbacks so wherein uh, flash bulb memories uh, classical examples they gave us the people remember what they did when something uh, uh, of severe nature happened for example uh, earlier they used to say that uh, 911 attack or uh, nowadays we can also say that when uh, when was the note ban was then what we were doing or uh, when the lockdown was announced so there are uh, people come and remember it uh, much more detail and flashbacks is much to do with uh, uh sorry so uh, one uh, experience that we had was uh, uh, regarding a uh, uh, post traumatic uh, stress disorder wherein uh, the person used to have uh, uh, repetitive recurrence of the uh, uh, events they they remembered it in so much of detail so uh, what we did was we actually uh, try to elicit much more details about uh, uh, same things about it again and again and uh, in the process uh, i don't know uh, because of the fatigue certain or uh, while narrating more so actually uh, those flashbacks were actually reduced later okay this was a uh, one experience lastly uh, before concluding i thought i'll make a mention about it is also left to the discussion as well and also to explore further regarding this it is memory impairment and developmental stages so intellectual disabilities and autism one example uh, we had was uh, with regard to a, a child uh, who was uh, remembering uh, that uh, i mean on showing the faces of people and saying that uh, okay this is what is emotion of a sadness happiness or fear but somehow the child on uh, viewing tvs wherein uh, there were uh, 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 faces wherein they were uh, looking happy but making a sarcastic remark okay so there was a mismatch so because in intellectually disabled children or autism affected children so they, they don't get it they take it on a literal sense so what happens uh, i mean uh, with regard to the memory that they have achieved by showing the the spaces and making them understand whether it gets lost so it is uh, debatable or still to be explored and also with regard to specific learning disorders uh, we would have experienced that the people who have this difficulties their memory in terms of remembering the letters the mental representation of the letters or images uh, uh, it is a different bit different and that's the reason why they have difficulty in actually retrieving that recalling and that's the reason why they suffer kind of embarrassments or kind of a inferiority 
with when uh, questions are asked to them or when they are asked to uh, write it down uh, so still i mean uh, it is to be explored further i'll uh, uh, leave it here and uh, end my talk though i've uh, initially mentioned that it would be comprehensive enough uh, but to just to stimulate that yeah why psychopathology it's relevant and uh, if there is any clinical utility that can be ma made out of it so i'll stop my presentation and i thank uh, the organizers for having given the opportunity and if there are any questions Yes, thank you thank you uh, vinay sir for your wonderful uh, presentation so i request all the uh, participants to post uh, their questions in the question answer uh, box so that uh, the speaker uh, can answer i noticed that sachin had raised his hand some time sachin would you like to ask a question He seems to have forgotten. I <laughs> think. Okay. I am here. Sachin is here. Sachin, you raised your hand. What is what is it that you would like to ask? Can you repeat the question? Or. Yes, uh, in question. Uh, there is one question, sir, hmm. from anonymous attendee. Hmm. Please explain about implicit and explicit memory with example. Okay. So, uh, explicit memory is nothing but a declarative memory. Uh, I gave an example of, uh, 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 for example, in a uh, uh, semantic memory. just remembering the fact that okay dr vinay is a psychiatrist as so a one example of a semantic while episodic memory would be in terms of uh, remembering it with some specific specifications like time and place that the person did uh, this presentation at this point of time so that's one example while implicit memory is a non declarative memory wherein uh, we unconsciously make use of the data and information in doing more often skills for example the riding a bike or uh, uh, playing a musical instrument so those are all actually are implicit memory see <clears throat> another, uh, another way to view memory disturbances is try and group them as disorders of working memory disorders of declarative memory and what is known as meta memory and then procedural memory these are four different aspects which you can clinically evaluate for example meta memory is extremely important in clinical practice you would have seen lot of uh, people with depression coming and complaining that i am not able to remember i keep forgetting right so that is a subjective evaluation of changes in memory which is influenced by their current emotional state that is meta memory which is very important to evaluate even in patients who are presenting with depression or other kind of mood disorders for example in mania it will be the reverse they'll say that i remember everything hmm? so the procedural memory is how do you really operate things you know can you describe to me as to how you will ride a cycle or how you make a cup of coffee or whatever it could be see this type of classification helps us to locate it in the clinical realm and there is also some kind of a neuro physiological neurobiological substrate to classify it in this fashion any other questions uh there is one question is perseveration organic in origin in most of the in most time yes more often uh, i mean organic uh, brain syndrome so we get perseveration perseveration is the hallmark in organic brain syndromes 
but it's also very, very common in politicians. <laughs> what happens in suppression and repression what are the ways of getting it back so i hope that uh, they are making a mention of a defense mechanisms here where suppression of uh, the things i mean which are coming to the conscious awareness for example somebody going into a interview will actually try to suppress uh, things which has happened at back at home that's a suppression while repression is one of the defense mechanism wherein uh, people forget about what they forgot for example uh, children they i mean the usual examples they gave us they forget about uh, somebody scolded them and they actually uh, gel with them happily so even they would have forgotten this so to they forgot that so i don't know how uh, i mean what are the ways of getting it back I means it's like repressed yeah see in that case one of the things repression is more consciously modulated i consciously modulate my recall that is suppression repression is a defense mechanism which is determined by various unconscious factors principally unconscious emotions associated with that you want to recollect right can they be recovered therein lies a big story about the recovered memories especially in people who report in psychotherapy sessions that they have been abused when they were children right so the therapeutic process help them to recover certain memories which were deeply embedded in their life see there is a lot of controversy about the repressed memory syndrome so we leave it aside but there is a way in which repressed memories can be recovered or played out in therapy and uh, the question is what is the earlier stage we can have uh, memory so in terms of developmental stages how far we can remember like infancy or early childhood what do you say vinay uh, it's a it's a difficult question i mean uh, i would say that it differs with people i mean whichever had a subjective uh, kind of a importance or emotional uh, background to it at least from the age of uh, Three years, four years. Yeah, recollection is dependent on other kind of cognitive development that occurs during early stages of our life. We won't remember our birth. As our cognitive functions develop in infancy and childhood, our ability to recall also goes in tandem with that. Implicit in the question that he is asking is the. You know, so for some time it was very popular, isn't it, that you can recollect memories in the previous life, yes. past life regression. So this person seems to be very interested in past life regression, as to how far you can take your memory back. Hmm? So if you are influenced by the, all the TV uh, episodes, you can <laughs> keep on tracing <laughs> back to empty number of previous lives. All of them are suspect. <laughs> There is one question by uh, Sachin. Explain in detail the memory deficits seen in post-cough psychosis. Sorry, I can get to what. What is the question? Uh, explain in detail uh, the memory deficits seen in post-cough psychosis. It is in the question and answer uh, box. Okay. okay. Yes, Vinay. So, yeah the korsakoff syndrome is uh, characterized by uh, both uh, in terms of uh, i mean registration would be intact retention and retrieval are the things getting affected here and that's the reason why i mean they tend to make up stories about things and uh, confabulate uh, as you know korsakoff syndrome is a kind of a late complication of uh, alcohol uh, dependent syndrome and wherein uh, Uh, there is a time in deficiency which is resulted in wernicke's encephalopathy which is not corrected so 
in this regard uh, i mean those two are the things i could remember and tell you that it's mainly to do with the uh, retention and the retrieval that uh, gets affected there's another question could you elaborate more on cryptomnesia so by definition is that uh, i gave an example of uh, people uh, saying that uh, quoting from a somewhere they would have read it and uh, they quote it as if they are it's their own in a in a current scenario it's come on to a kind of a plagiarism so uh, uh, this is uh, based on maybe a dissociative state or even uh, uh, for example uh, somebody who has already made a statement and then to justify it or with a sense of uh, losing a reputation so they try to justify it rather than uh, anything so it's still i mean debatable or controversial i would say uh, what's your take on this uh, program cryptomnesia is a very uh, hazy concept so if one moment you include plagiarism as a manifestation of cryptomnesia you are in very dangerous territory in the sense <laughs> plagiarism is a very consciously modulated activity by a research scholar he really plagiarizes and passes it off on his own for whatever there is an intention and a conscious attempt at that right so in some of the other cryptomnesia there may not be a conscious attempt right he may just say that and then when people are asked then he'll try and pass it off as his own so there seems to be a difference in the in the two there is also a question on a brief about neurobiology of memory this looks like a short notes in md question paper <laughs> okay neurobiology of memory to say it in brief in 2 minutes it's a long haul but i leave it to the wisdom of uh, vinay yeah, actually this is a psychopathology series is it not no 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 problem <laughs> he's preparing for the exam no problem <laughs> If I can answer it in two minutes. It's fantastic. So I think we cannot do justice in uh, on this particular context of a psychopathology series. You could give him some reference to read. Simple, you know. We move on to the next one. How to differentiate between delusional memory and retrospective falsification? Actually, that's in the realm of delusions, not in the realm of memory disturbance. So we'll skip it. Okay. This is uh, next question is important. In mental status examination, kindly mention the steps of assessment of memory in terms of registration, retention, recognition, and recall. Right. This first year pg so kindly help him as to how to clinically evaluate memory functions in the ms so uh, uh, the subdivisions under which uh, the memory is tested is immediate recent and remote memory so usually when uh, when we are interviewing so if the person is saying uh, uh, repeating the things for example uh, and asking so if he is asking relevantly so that would actually uh, given a uh, kind of a memory testing is done like uh, asking uh, either uh, names of three objects and uh, distract him by asking few other questions or serial subtraction and then again asking him to recall it so that would test his recent memory other way of uh, doing assessment is also to ask questions like uh, what he had in the breakfast how did he come to the hospital and also corroborate this with the family members to ensure that okay he has said it right so that's a recent memory while remote memory testing involves asking questions pertaining to autobiographical uh, memories for example uh, it could be date of birth date of marriage date of uh, joining a job or it could be a uh, some events important events in his life so those are the uh, remote memories that that's how it can be tested 
Sir, regarding tap grass and Fregoli syndrome, that uh, are they connected to memory problems or it's just delusion? What do you feel, Vinay? Uh, sir, uh, it comes under kind of a distortion of a recall, wherein uh, uh, they give a, a delusional interpretation to uh, the people. And uh, uh, that's how they falsely uh, attach, for example, uh, is an imposter. And it involves memory, I believe, sir, rather than only a delusion. But it is classified under delusion, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yeah. See, what you are trying to explain is that delusion may have some antecedents in terms of recall, in terms yes. of certain memory issues. That is explanation for the delusion, right? But the definition of capgras is in the realm of delusions. Explanation may be in relation to memory issues. Okay, sir. Why students with exam tell they can't memorize which what they have read? <laughs> this, this chap is going for exam soon, so kindly help him. <laughs> I didn't get the question, sir. Or Why question? students with exams tell okay. that they cannot memorize what they have read? Okay. There are various reasons. <laughs> I would say one thing is sleep deprivation, wherein consolidation of the memory happens, which we frequently encounter, and uh, anxiety states, wherein uh, Though registration happens, the retention part gets affected, say, wherein they'll have to uh, uh, read up for so much in a short span of time, which is, uh, again, uh, kind of, uh, practically difficult. So these are the commoner things, I think, that, uh, I mean, why uh, they can't memorize. And also, uh, there are techniques wherein uh, memory, there is something called as associative uh, learning or associating with some other things so that we remember it better. I mean, just like mnemonics are just trying to remember it like uh, visual memory. Okay, this part of left, left side of the page, uh, kind of a table. So making use of such uh, things associate. So maybe the person won't be using that. And also maybe one other reason could be that, uh, I mean, uh, undergraduates, they say keep saying that uh, they, they remember it better when heard from their students, I mean, their colleagues, I mean, friends, but when they go through visually, so they have difficulties. That would also mean that it's a, there's a kind of a differential learners, uh, auditory, visual, auditory and kinesthetic learners who learn differently. That may, may also be one of the reason. Uh, these are the things I could think of at this point of time. See, when you're appearing for an exam and you have difficulty in remembering Recollecting is basically recollection, right? So if you are in a theory exam, there is a, there is some space that is available for you. So when you see the question paper, some of it immediately you remember, you answer first. Some of it you don't remember, you keep it at the end. By the time you keep it at the end, you feel that you have done well in the previous questions, your level of confidence increases and your ability to Recall also might improve, and you will answer the question which you don't, which initially you didn't remember as well. So if there is a leeway in writing an essay, I mean in theories, but in practical exam it's a totally different ball game because more than the anxiety of the student, the anxiety is induced by the examiner, right? So when he walks in, especially for the viva presenting of cases and all that. See, there is an aura about the exam process, the, what kind of examiner, what kind of questions they will ask. So there is a lot of anticipatory anxiety associated with performance anxiety. Because when the examiner asks a question, your skill is assessed by the kind of answers that you give, right? So there is also performance anxiety. So both combined together, results in problems of retrieval and recollection and answering the question. So the basic thing is de-stress the exam process. 
if I can give you a simple clue, assume that you know more than the examiner. And that is true of all the examiners these days. Right? Sorry to say that. Just because mm -hmm. you're a professor, just you feel that they are so well read, they know much more than you. Right? Professors lead a very busy life. Right? They have very academic challenges, very busy practice. So if a very well-prepared student basically will know much more than the examiner. You go to the exam with that kind of confidence in you, not overconfidence, right? With the confidence that you have read well, that you know well. Don't focus attention too much on the examiner sitting across, because whatever you have learned in the last three years is what is going to serve you, right? If you have done good clinical um, you know, practice combined with regular reading, then you'll, you're well prepared for the exam, right? See, medical examination is not just a, uh, uh, you know, MCQ. It is based on your clinical expertise. If you, three years, if you work by the bedside and moment you see a particular case, go back and read about it, go back and read theory associated with it, it as a template, it will remain within you forever. So if you do that kind of associative learning, exam is a breeze. And any of all the examiners are giving you 100% these days because they are scared. If the student has failed, you know, he'll either complain about the examiner or he'll do something else. So <laughs> the examiner is more anxious to pass you than yourself. So it's much easier, I think. There is one more question. Which is the best instrument to assess the dementia and memory disturbances in illiterate patients? Sorry, come again, I didn't. Which is the best instrument to assess dementia and memory disturbances in illiterate patients? Is that? There is a uh, in the mental status examination, uh, so which can be made use of. And also, uh, in terms of local languages, or even uh, there can be customization, which can be done on that HMSE as well. Any other? No, no other questions. I thought somebody will ask you this is a common question that is asked in exams and common dilemma in clinical practice is how do you distinguish psychogenic amnesia from organic amnesia, right? This is, this is a dilemma in clinical practice. Hmm? So any suggestions on that, Vinay? Uh, you distinguish between psychogenic and organic amnesia. Psychogenic amnesia, if at all, if you can establish uh, underlying psychiatric disorders, for example, uh, depression, dissociative disorder or anxiety disorder under which it, it, it explains the uh, part of uh, amnesia. So that is one thing. And then obviously uh, in terms of uh, investigations, organicity is nothing but there is some kind of a demonstrable pathology uh, behind uh, this amnesia, for example, uh, temporal uh, lobe lesion. So uh, these are the other things which, uh, and also in terms of uh, following head injuries or uh, uh, infective etiologies. So there can be uh, lesions found uh, in the regions of uh, hippocampus and related structures. So that uh, go goes more favor in case of organic dementia, I mean, sorry, organic uh, amnesia. And uh, psychogenic also can be uh, in terms of uh, at times it's there, at times it's not there, depending on like, for example, mood states. So, and also it varies in terms of presentation. So, for example, I quoted an example of a girl wherein uh, the amnesia part uh, varied between day to day and also in terms of uh, time uh, in a day even. So, those are all indicative of uh, psychogenic amnesia. These are the few points I could uh, recollect and 
actually, sir. See, there is a bit of controversy in strictly delineating between psychogenic and organic dementia. Because even in organic base, I mean, memory disturbance rooted on organic basis, there could be psychogenic elements, right? So, and then secondly, the issue the terminology, is it psychogenic? Is it functioning, functional? It is non-organic. So there are a lot of debates going on. Okay. But what we must remember in psychogenic amnesia is, number one, it occurs on the background of identifiable stress factors, identifiable stress factors. Often there is an associated psychiatric problem, usually depression. And thirdly, sometimes there could be minor tra head trauma, minor head trauma. That creates a lot of problem, right? For example, in post-concussion syndrome, very, it's a very uh, trivial kind of an accident, right? The severity of the accident may not be that much, but there could be a lot of problems in terms of memory disturbances. And that can also be influenced by the emotional state of the individual. So even in psychogenic amnesia, there could be a, an organic component. So nowadays they feel that the differentiation between psychogenic and organic cannot be done on purely based on clinical parameters, right? You have to have background information. You have to have neuropsychological assessment plus neuroradiological inputs. So it is a very multidimensional way in which you have to distinguish between the two. But clinically, what is useful is what is known as Ribot's law, R-A-B-O-T, Ribot's law. What is Ribot's law, if I can ask you? Any idea, Vinay? Uh, so I remember having read it, but... Uh... Yeah. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry to put you in the squad. See, Ribot's, Ribot's law basically states in organic conditions, what is recently learned is often forgotten. Yes. and not remember. Whereas the reverse is true in psychogenic amnesia. What is forgotten is what is learned in the past, right? So that is one kind of a simple guideline in clinical practice to apply Ribot's law and say whether it is helpful for you to distinguish between the two. But it can be a very, very um, important clinical dilemma practically when you see a client. And when you see a client, you must explore all possibilities because the interface between the psychological and the organic components can interweave very, very closely. So if you, you just can't say it is purely psychogenic, purely organic, because nothing is purely organic. Yes, sir. Any other questions have come? There is one question, sir. How can you differentiate between dementia of normal aging and Alzheimer's? That's a different, yeah, please. Uh, sir, the question should have been memory loss of normal aging rather than dementia of normal dementia aging. Dementia of yes. normal aging. Because we don't call it uh, dementia then. Yeah, um, absolutely. So it's much more to do with the kind of a benign forgetfulness and maybe uh, even the mild cognitive impairment uh, gets into the picture here because it stands in between uh, normal aging and then dementia. So, uh, a clear cut uh, in terms of going by uh, diagnostic criteria, dementia will have a, a, a deterioration of intellectual functions occurring in a chronic more often. Uh, with whatever uh, criteria we have for, uh, I mean, the, the question was uh, regarding Alzheimer's and uh, uh, normal, normal aging. aging. Okay. So Alzheimer's dementia is uh, more often a diagnosis of exclusion uh, out of all the dementias because dementias can happen with uh, regard to vascular etiology, infective, and uh, more often uh, if there is a dementia and we don't get any uh, evidence of other organicities, so it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So imaging will help in, in terms of uh, uh, knowing age-appropriate uh, cortical atrophy, wherein in Alzheimer's, it will be age-inappropriate atrophy. Uh, then, 
Another question that has come is, well, tell us about the memory disturbance in delirium. So delirium, uh, it's all the three uh, stages are affected in terms of registration. Uh, obviously, when registration gets affected because of the inattention, because there will be a clouding of consciousness during a delirium. So uh, all the stages gets affected. But can you assess memory in a delirious patient? No, sir. Period. <laughs> Attention and impairment is uh, too severe, uh, I think. So, to go ahead and comment on memory disturbances. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions before we wind up? Mm, no questions. No questions. Then, Vinay, thank you very much. It was a very thank interesting you. outline of memory disturbances. With What I particularly liked was that you embellished it with clinical examples from your own you know, experience. That is very important. Often I notice, even in other kind of phenomenology, people will quote uh, examples from uh, Frank Fish. Whatever is there in the book, they will quote it as an example. So it is very nice that you embellished it with examples from your own clinical experience. Mm -hmm. Thank so you, sir. It's it was also a learning experience so, for me as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was a very interesting webinar. My only suggestion is I noticed there's a couple of anonymous people who are tapping in. See, if there are students, they don't have to feel fearful. They don't have to... See, this is a forum in which you can freely express, share your doubts, because this is the entire purpose of this web webinar. I would suggest the organizers to do away with this anonymous attendees. Everybody must yes. receive their identity, right? Unless yes, sir, identity yes. disturbances. <laughs> yes, sir. Definitely, sir. Definitely. Go for pages. We will take it. <laughs> so whenever there is an anonymous thing, you must tell, tell them back, unless you reveal yourself, right? You can't yes, be part of the yes, program, right? Yes, sir. Definitely, sir. Narayan and Harish, right? And of course, Vinay. Thank mm -hmm. you, sir. Till we meet again yes. in person sometime in the near future. <laughs> sure, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good night. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Raghuram, sir, for chairing the session and Dr. Vinay for speaking and uh, enlightening us on. Uh, Psychopathology related to the disorders of memory, and I would like to thank our IPSKC organizing team and EC members, president and secretary, and Dr. Harish as my co-moderator. And finally, as uh, icon team, uh, Mr. Sriram is here, and uh, Ms. Bina. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, one and all. Thank you. So, with permission of chairperson, can we wind up, please? Sir? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good Thank night you. to all of you. Good night. Good night. Thank you.